Okay, welcome everybody to our expert-led event on resequencing systems and systems thinking, practicing theorizing and philosophizing as systems changes learning. And it's been led by our good friend David Im. David is a research fellow with the Creative Systemic Research Platform Institute. He served as president of the International Society for the System Sciences, IEEE 2011 to 2012, and is currently representative of the trustees to the board of directors of the IEEE. For 28 years, David was at IBM, and he had assignments in management consulting, executive education, market development, and headquarter planning. David has also been a visiting fellow for the Centre for System Studies, so it's lovely to welcome David back, and also his very supportive wife at the back, <laughs> Deanna. And it's lovely to have you both with us today. So thank you both very much, and over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so uh, thanks for having me. Um, the slides are available for people who are online and for you if you want to look at them. I have to warn you, there are a hundred slides. Um, so it's actually at coevolving.com um, slash commons slash publications. And so you can look that up afterwards. So the talk I'm going to give today is um, resequencing systems thinking. Um, this follows from my ISSS presidency when the talk was rethinking system thinking, and that was in 2011, 2012. It got published in SRBS in 2013. Um, at that point, um, uh, being critical of systems thinking, I felt that there's a lot of system thinking that's frozen in the 1980s. And so the question was, if we're looking for something different, what we should be looking for? <coughs> and I spent... Uh, uh, some time working um, on a PhD in Finland, uh, spent some time working in the pattern language community, about three years, uh, 2014 to 2017, Christopher Alexander pattern language. And then in 2019, I, 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 we have a group in Toronto called System Thinking Ontario. We meet monthly. Uh, it's online now a lot of the times. Uh, but when, we, um, uh, when I, I brought the group together, I said, I'm looking for a group of people who will meet for 10 years on a very hard project, which is rethinking system thinking. The only thing I can tell you is that we'll be meeting at least once every three weeks. Why every three weeks? Well, two weeks is kind of too frequent, one, four weeks too long, so arbitrarily every three weeks. And so we're now in year six of 10. Uh, we have um, three journal articles published. Uh, we have uh, one more coming. We have a chapter published. So there's been a lot of stuff coming out. and. Um, well, I'll explain a little bit about how all that fits together. So we're at the initiating part. I'm going to just get you oriented a little bit towards the talk. We have three sections. Now, the orientation for this talk is it actually is a systems practice talk. However, we backed into it because uh, in discovering the issues in systems practice, we decided that we had to go back through the science and into the philosophy. And so I'm going to have to cover the philosophy part first, and then eventually you'll see the shifts and we'll get into the practice at the end. So we'll start off in, the, uh, in this first part. Uh, we'll do some philosophizing, and there's three sections there. Uh, each section is usually about you know, eight, ten slides, and we'll work right through them. Um, then we'll have a break and an exercise uh, with each one of these, and we'll have an opportunity for you to sit in your groups and discuss uh, a little bit, and I'll, I'll cue you on those. So as I said, in Toronto, we have the System Changes Learning Circle. Uh, we originate from the Center for Social Innovation, OCAD University, in the Strategic Foresight Innovation Program, um, and System Thinking Ontario, which is the monthly meetings. Um, so Dan and Kelly and Zad and I have a meeting continuously. Uh, where We've turned now from, in effect, the philosophy and the science part into the practice part. Uh, but with the background, it's now getting published. Now, this is me and my brother in 1964. Uh, what you're going to find is a lot of this talk starts going into Chinese philosophy. But make no mistake, I was born and raised in Gravenhurst, which is a small town in Muskoka um, in, uh, in Ontario, Canada. 
Uh, probably if the most famous people near us would probably be that Goldie Hawn and, Ru and uh, Kurt Russell have a cottage up in that area. It's cottage land up in Canada. Um, but I was brought up with my grandparents, and a lot of the research that I've been doing has been uncovering a lot of the conventional wisdom that my grandmother had. It's kind of like, why would you say something? And it's like, what do you mean by that? So it's, things are obvious to her. Like, it's this, this idea that brandy is warming and scotch is cooling. And I kind of ask, why is that? And she goes, well, it's obvious. And it's like, well, it's not obvious to me at all. But it's built into the Chinese philosophy, and it's taken a lot of time for me to uncover that again. So I live in Toronto. Um, I have a, more than a million air miles, uh, so I travel around a lot. Uh, there's four parts of me that you might be interested in. The first part is the commercial part. Uh, I worked at IBM for 28 years, um, and that's a part that people generally don't see because when I blog, I was actually one of the top bloggers at IBM when I was there in the later years, but people don't see that work because management consulting all the stuff you don't see. Um, there's the part of me which is research, uh, going through uh, starting off with decision support systems, getting into socio-technical systems, getting into system sciences, and focus a lot on service science. Most recently, getting a Chinese philosophy, so that's a relatively new thing. Uh, I've taught in various places, the Rotman School, uh, taught a lot in Finland, I've uh, been at Hull, also university, was teaching at OCADU, and uh, my family, I'm a husband for the whole period, uh, and uh, four sons now all grown up, uh, learning to be an in-law, uh, haven't quite, no grandkids yet, we're still working on that. So the fundamental question that we're asking um, that came out and we, the first thing was, well, we want to look at system thinking and look and see what's happening, what's different. And we came up with this question, is systems changes different from not systems changes? So what do people mean by that? Because we started seeing these things like the OEC Observatory and Public Sector Innovation, Data Program and Systems Change, Stanford Social Innovation Review, UNDP, and this one, which was close to us, the Forum for the Future of the McConnell Foundation, they actually had a meeting in 2018, and it was actually in Canada. So it's a social innovation exchange worldwide. They brought in people from, uh, from uh, philanthropic organizations that tend to fund systems change, and they said, okay, we're interested in systems change, but when you actually look at the report, they said, we're not going to define it. We're just going to build on it. And it's like, okay, you can do that, but it's like you guys haven't defined what systems change is and what system change isn't. So that's part of the question. Is it something different from systems thinking? Do we need a different approach? Just to be clear, so I think people here may be familiar with the uh, Ramage and Ship um, systems thinkers articles. So we have the full field here, system thinking, uh, early cybernetics, general systems theory, system dynamics, soft and critical systems, later cybernetic complexity theory, learning systems. The, t the directions that we generally lean on are these three. We tend to focus on the general systems theory, soft and critical systems, and then learning systems. From there, we add on all these other things that are really not in the book. So socio-ecological systems, uh, Buzz Hollingworth, uh, Tim Allen, uh, Johan Rockstrom. So the, Tim Allen uh, was in the ISS as a president, and so a lot of his work on ecology um, has, has been into this. Um, Rockstrom, of course, is the Stockholm Resilience Center, so all that stuff comes into that play. Uh, service Science with Richard Norman, Jim Spohr at IBM, Gary Metcalf has been working with me on that. Systemic Design, uh, Harold Nelson uh, and uh, Berger Sevelson in, uh, in Norway, Peter Jones was in Toronto, and they created the uh, Related System Thinking and Design Conferences at Systemic Design Association. Uh, ecological Anthropology, particularly with J.J. Gibson and Tim Ingold, had been an influence in there. And then uh, post-colonial and Chinese philosophy of science. Keacock Lee is in Manchester, so we'll be seeing her on Wednesday, one of the purposes of the trip. Uh, Francois Julien is a uh, sinologist in the French Academy. And John Law has been doing a lot of work on the post-colonial crossing over uh, from Western um, to Eastern approaches. Okay, so we're going to spend some time philosophizing. Um, and what I've got here is, we're talking about resequencing. I'm talking about, um, and it may be a question, in practice does it make a difference versus theoretically or philosophically? But what I'm going to do is try to get you to think less of or deprecate, so as an example, 
think a little bit less of metaphilosophy and a little bit more of what post-colonial construction is. And, and so I'd like you to, to think less or deprecate behavioral structuralists' views and elevate ecological processualists, a little bit less on progress and ideals, a little more on contextual dyadicism. And so this is not to tell you that there's one thing right or wrong, but we start off with a position and we kind of ignore the other position. So one of the things that, uh, that uh, a big idea will be, we often focus on space as opposed to time. What happens if we focus on time before we focus on space? And how does that change the way that we do things? And we'll have this exercise at the end uh, where I'll ask you to think about, as opposed to think about structure, then process, think about process, then structure. So we'll talk about that. Some of this research comes out from the idea of causal textures. How many people have read the causal textures paper? Uh oh. This is 1965, Emory and Trist. Okay. It rings a bell, but uh, I, I, I can't recall. Okay. So, so this was um, so uh, Emory and Trist at the Tavistock Institute. They are the ones that started with the uh, socio. I'll go on four one slide. The socio-psychological, socio-technical, and socio-psychological, socio socio-technical, and socio-ecological systems perspectives. There are three volumes of all their work. And if you go back to the original, so the, the first was the, um, the uh, socio-psychological, which in effect was having society readjust to soldiers coming back from the Second World War, PTSD, all that sort of stuff. So one approach would be, okay, we need to have the soldiers change. The other would be, how do we get society to change as opposed to changing the soldiers? The second, the socio-technical systems perspective was bring in mechanization. And they brought in the ideas of machines. And originally in the coal mines, what was it that was happening there when they brought in machines? It used to be that they would have um, a team go in and dig out the coal and they became like a family. But what happened is you introduced a long wall machine and it, people became cranks and they had, and how do they work on that? So a lot of the work design in the 1970s, 1980s was based on socio-technical. The socio-ecological perspective was the result of changes and, and those rapid changes that were happening in the world. And so the question was, okay, you have all these things happening, um, and now you've got things happening at a faster pace than they were happening before. And so how does that all relate? And so let me back up one. <coughs> The causal texture of organizational environments was the idea that the world was changing so fast. And the way they're looking at it, if you think about the system as an organization, you have the part-part relations, so what's happening inside the organization. You have the planning process, where the system is impacting the environment, that's the, and that's the planning process. And you have the learning from the environment, which is the environment going back in. But what was new for them was the L22, learning 2.2, which is the environment having impact on the environment itself. And so this was called, this paper, The Causal Texture of Organizational Environments. But it's like, what do they mean by causal texture? And it took a long time for me to track that down. It's like, OK, they've used that word, but I actually don't know what it really means. So when we're talking about these three perspectives, what happens is that they are they all happen concurrently, but when they're published in the three volumes, they are published sequentially. They started with the socio-psychological, socio-technical, and the socio-ecological. And so here, the socio-ecological, they're talking about the context of the increasing level of interdependence, complexity, and uncertainty in societies, and emergent values, cooperation, and nurturance. And so we're talking about a different shift, whereas socio-technical, socio-technical systems and joint optimization, and so the question is really about what was happening inside the organization versus outside the organization. So fundamentally, when, when I talk to an organization and they're talking about advice, what sort of advice, my question is, what's changing more? What's, where, where is the disorder? Is the disorder more inside the organization or is the disorder more outside the organization? And we'll see that it switches between the two. Um, and so we've got to go back and forth to socio-ecological and socio-technical. Now, this is the original 1969 uh, paperback by Emery. It's actually a rare book now. If you have one in the library, they should actually carry it. Um, but the interesting thing that came with this edition of uh, System Thinking 
was there was a footnote in the part one, Preston's System Thinking, only pressing problems of space precludes a selection from Stephen C. Pepper. This is of particular importance because of the root metaphor that identifies and rigorously defines all clearly operating and different system theorists and accounts for much of the mutual in incomprehension that links between them. Contextualism is the root metaphor that comes closest to our bias selecting its volume. So actually, what happens though is people actually don't focus on the contextualism, and I'll show you that. They focus on the organicism, and we'll get, get that separation. The organicism tends to be more about the socio-technical systems, and the contextualism is more about the socio-ecological systems. So I've been doing research on this, and, uh, and I, I ran a session, so this is from LinkedIn. So I posted that in, on January 9th, and this, this is in 2022, that I was going to have this discussion about Stephen Pepper's work. And lo and behold, I get this nice compliment from Dr. Michael C. Jackson. Very interesting, David. <laughs> and so he said, it's nice to bring it back. And, and, the, and the interesting part here is that my own view is that they did not succeed and the organicism continued to dominate in the L22 world and even in the later sociological work. I recently had a speak with Marilyn Emery on this, who of course says, I am wrong. Mike's wrong. And that he and Fred's later work clearly is contextualist. I argue, it's in this chapter of the book, is this chapter that Marilyn objected to? So, at one of the IFSR conversations, uh, I had arranged for Marilyn to come and actually be in the group that we discussed this. I'm with Mike, that Marilyn does not understand contextualism. Which is a problem, actually, right now, because in Australia, she's actually getting a following again. But it's, it's not that it's it's um, necessarily wrong, but the frame in which she's looking at it is socio-technical. She's looking inside an organization and saying, oh, that's actually contextualist. Well, the contextualist stuff is happening outside the organization more than it's inside. So this is a nice encouragement that I'm on the right path. So this leads us into a long history of science. Now, the people that I'm following in the, in the current day would be uh, Fred Emery, uh, Wes Churchman, and Russ Acoff. Russ Aikoff um, is key. He's the single most published author in system thinking. Um, and my friend David Hawk was Russ Aikoff's first PhD student, so I get all the insights about what was happening in the program in the 1970s, 1980s when, when he was doing that work. But we can trace all the way back to the Metaphysical Club and the beginnings of pragmatism with William James and Pierce. Now, um, first, um, what happens is that we, can, we start tracing Churchman and Acoff were, in effect, disciples of Edgar Singer. And so you have all this work on purposeful systems and those sorts of things, and I'll get into a little more of it. So there's this branch of, of, of Singer that goes through and traces to uh, Churchman and Acoff and also Emery and Trist. However, you also have another thread with Stephen Pepper, um, and this actually comes from William James, so uh, Ralph Barton Perry was a professor who actually wrote most of the work about James's um, philosophy after James had passed. And Pepper was his student, and then uh, went to Berkeley. Um, and so uh, the, the trying try to place these things in history, Pepper uh, went, went to Berkeley, and Berkeley was such a new school at that point. This is a professor of aesthetics. He founded the art school at Berkeley. That's, that's how old this is. The other thing is that he actually uh, invited uh, Kuhn, before he wrote The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, to come to Berkeley uh, because he did not get tenure at Harvard. And so there's some questions when people say, oh, you know, Thomas Kuhn stole his ideas from somewhere else. It's possible that he stole most of them from Pepper. So this idea, and nice to have the encouragement from Mike Jackson, saying that, oh, Pepper, you should look at Pepper some more and understand where that's coming from. So. We can look into World Hypotheses by Pepper. Um, the book's now been republished, but let me summarize to you the four World Hypotheses it comes up to. Um, the, the axes are a little bit confusing, but they become clear as you go along. So the world, the way it organizes these are dispersive manner for organizing evidence versus integrated manner for organizing evidence. So do things come together or do they come apart? And then analytic mode of reasoning versus synthetic mode of reasoning. So we start off with formism, with um, the root metaphor of similarity, which is a feature, and that's how you identify something. So 
when you're looking at a system, how is the system like that other system? The way that Pepper described this, described this as, you talk about a yellow sheet of paper. Okay, a yellow sheet of paper is like another yellow sheet of paper. Well, how do you know that? Well, it's yellow. Well, which, what color of yellow? Like, there's formism. It's like, it's paper, and it's a sheet of paper, and it's this size. But when we talk about a yellow sheet of paper, you're going, oh, I know what that means. There, it has the same form. That is analytic and dispersive. From there, we go into mechanism. The root metaphor is machine, where there's some exerting force or energy that produces predictable outcomes. Um, and it's integrative. So a machine puts things together, but it's analytic because you can take it apart. From here, we go to organicism. The root metaphor is constructive development. And there's an ordinance of changes from stage to stage. Now, when we talk about time, it's important. So when we're talking about formism, we're talking about a sheet of paper, yellow sheet of paper, time is irrelevant. We come over here, we talk about a machine, time is relevant as a schematic because there's pieces of clock, there's the way you put, you put things together in a certain order. With organicism, the nature of time is a directional arrow, successive integration. So if you talk about a, a caterpillar that goes into a pupa that becomes a butterfly, it happens in that order. And organicism, uh, Pepper had used the word organicism not because he was trying to get the idea of biology into it, but the idea of part whole. Because you have the parts that develop into the whole. So contextualism, the root metaphor is situation as a historic event in its living actuality. And the nature of time is a qualitative duration. It is not just a point in time. It is a duration of time when things happen. And it's uh, relative to a species present. So this is best described in terms of kairos rather than chronos. This is clock time, chronos. A machine works in, cl in, in clock time. But in contextualism, the historic event is that we actually work in what we feel as time. So if you talk about a, a drum machine versus a drummer, a drummer works in Kairos, a drum machine works in Kronos, right? So contextualism, this is actually the definition of contextualism, and it's actually tricky to work its way through. Now what I'm going to do, and I'll give you the answer that I've got to catch up to, is the there are four world hypotheses that Pepper created, and he said, I'm not sure, there may be more world hypotheses. Now, in the Meta Philosophy Journal, he actually reviewed Irvin Laszlo's first book and said, I think that systems thinking may be another world hypothesis, but I don't know. And then there's some you know, reviews going back and forth, but Laszlo never responded, probably didn't care. You know, Pepper's meta philosophist, and these philosophers don't necessarily mix together, so he let that go. But what I'm proposing now is what we call contextualism. I use the word texture here specifically because texture is not text. When people say context, if they make the mistake and say it's about text, no, it's got nothing to do with text. It has to do with texture. It's weaving things together because that's where this comes in. So there's contextualism and there's dyadicism, and the dyadicism comes from Chinese philosophy. And I'll explain more of that to go along. The root metaphor is tidescape, windscape. So the idea or the or metaphor you can use is you can be on a ship or you can be on a shore, but you have the tides coming in and out, and you've got the wind blowing. So there's two things happening to it at the same time. You have living rhythms irregularly lining up in diachrony. Diachrony is going to be a new word for you, because most people tend to, tend to think of synchrony. Everything syncs up in time. Diachrony, dia, means through. So things line up through time, not at a point in time. The nature of time is chaotic, um, like it is a contextualism, and there's propitious periods and inopportune periods. So those of you who have heard Chinese people say, oh, it's an auspicious day to get married. It's a lucky day to get married. That's where this sort of idea comes from. There are good days to get married, there are bad days to get married, and they have a whole system worked out for that. So that's kind of at the end point of all this, but um, this is the philosophy that's underneath all of that. And it's described here as being synthetic, but it includes both the dispersive and the integrative. And I'll show more about that when I get into the Chinese philosophy. Now, going back and trying to map out the perspectives, um, we have the dispersive and the integrative. 
an analytic and a synthetic here. So what I would say is that if we look at the um, psychosociological perspective, it's integrative and analytic in epistemology. And if you actually break it down, both the socio-ecological and socio-technical are synthetic. They're putting things together, um, which means that you actually get these kind of inferred analytic and ecological perspective and a technical perspective if you actually just looked at them separately. So socio-ecological would be people in the world with all things happening. Ecological is not social per se. If you want the more, the more outside anthropology and go deal with nature, it's up in this world. Um, socio-technical, if you take just the machine, we get up in the technical perspective here. So this is inferring back in using Pepper's, Pepper's four and trying to put it in the other way together. So what I'm looking at now is trying to combine the socio-ecological and socio-technical systems perspectives and in the Emory and Trist work, they are perspectives, and that's the way you do it in Western philosophy. But in Chinese philosophy, I'll make them dyadic. So I'll come back to that. Now, the idea of post-colonial philosophy of science, a good place to study that's in Taiwan. Um, and what they do is that they use, um, in effect, the diagnosis techniques they're used in Chinese medicine, but they do it along with Western medicine. So. The, if you actually read this article um, that, uh, that comes out with, um, uh, with Lin and Law, the funny thing is that they do, in, in, in Taiwan, the way that they, the Chinese doctors work is they use the old traditional methods, but the way they get paid is by Western billing codes. And so they have to build a bit bridge between them. So um, Western techniques are taking a three-finger pulse, as an example. Um, they look in, in your mouth and ask, look under your tongue to find out what your color is. Now, the Western is, and what they describe is that they actually do a blood pressure cuff. And so it's not that they ignore Western medicine, but they do both in that case. So this is, this is what can be called post-colonial science, because it's not necessarily saying that one is better than the other. It's a mix of Western and Chinese techniques. When we look at going across the philosophies, classical Chinese philosophy in particular, and I have to emphasize that this is classical Chinese philosophy. This is not modern Chinese philosophy. What happened when Mao took over uh, is that he brought in um, uh, dialectical materialism from Marxism. So the modern Chinese philosophy is not this way. You have to go back before Mao uh, into the traditional. But if you actually look at Chinese philosophy, there's three ways of approaching it. One is an exclusionist perspective, which says, and Kant was really bad at this, Kant was um, unwilling, and he said, in effect, there's no such thing as Chinese philosophy. So that's ignoring that a philosophy might exist. Comparative paradigm is that, okay, well, there's Western philosophy and there's Chinese philosophy, and you can compare them, but they're different. And the constructionist paradigm is that there may be a new way of seeing if we actually combine the Western and the Chinese philosophies. So much of what I'm trying to do is in that in that world. Okay, more encouragement. Uh, Deborah Hammond, another former president of the ISSS, uh, was interviewing uh, Wes Churchman, which is doing her research work, and he often identified the Chinese I Ching. I Ching translate into the Book of Changes. And it's a bit tricky to talk about changes when you're doing system changes, because that was the first place we looked. And the reason that we started, you think that you're doing a, book, a research product on systems changes, you might start with the I Ching, but there's so many assumptions built into reading that or looking into it that we had to back off and we back into the science, into, into Chinese medicine, because then you have something a little more concrete, it's not so abstract. But what he said was the oldest systems approach, it might be a systemic approach in contrast with the more systematic approaches of rationalist Western thought. And that's what we're getting out into now as we're working into practice. People say they want to be more systemic, but do they really just want to be systematic? Um, and, and that's an interesting bridge you have to jump over. Um, so we talked about the pre-Socratics. We'll get into the pre-Socratics in a little bit. But you talk about dynamic processes um, and more concerned with classification and order. And, and, and the way that you approach these um, is, is different. And it's taken a while to get this sort of adjustment. Well, it's nice to have West Churchman saying at least that he was interested in the work, but he never actually went past this. So I was talking to Harold Nelson, who was one of his later students, and he was saying that they talked about it, but West never wrote anything about it. Okay, so.
So we're going to switch now to uh, the second section, which is behavioral structuralist versus ecological processionalist. And I give you a little clarification here about what we mean by ecological, because it may not mean what you think it means. So back in uh, the 1950s, we had this idea of behavioral psychology. Behavioral psychology was a stimulus response sort of thing. And in effect, you're trying to figure out what's going on inside the head. And so you ring the bell, the dog salivates, and they're going, okay, well, what's happening inside the dog's head? That's essentially behavioral psychology. An ecological approach to perception came from J.J. Gibson. Um, for those of you who ever heard of the word affordance, affordance was a word that was created by Gibson. And what he was trying to do was understand how aircraft pilots land on a ship that's moving. We're talking the Navy, and you have the ships moving, and you have to go like this. And what he decided was that no, no, understanding what's going on in the pilot's head really doesn't help you that much. You have to understand what's happening in interaction between the aircraft and the carrier and how those things move together. So an ecological perception, e ecological perspective is what your head is inside of. So a lot of the um, of issues in system thinking that we're dealing with, and we start talking about reduction, is people start looking inside the head. And so the suggestion is, could you actually take an ecological approach to go, okay, but then it's like, well, do you really know what an ecological approach is? I want to know what your head is inside. And so if we're actually doing therapy, there are approaches that are based off ecological approaches. And what we try to do is not change what's inside your head. We try to change the situation around you. And then we, and we let the world change you, as opposed to you trying to change what's inside. So it's a different approach. Now, we can think about dwelling. Um, and it's interesting reading, uh, for those of you who read the Heidegger article on, on dwelling, um, there's an there's idea about living and dwelling together. Uh, but the dwelling is, n is not necessarily about a landscape as we think about it. You're living in a place. You can also think about dwelling in time. And so temporality is, is uh, one of the ideas. Uh, and Tim Ingold, he wrote this book called The Temporality of the Landscape. And in effect, he was saying, when you think landscape, when you're thinking about, about change and think about living somewhere, as opposed to living where, you could ask about living when. And think about temporality instead. And what he tries to say is, can you actually temporize the landscape and think about things in terms of time, as opposed to thinking in terms of place? And that means what we hear and what activities we have in it, because we actually shape the world that we're in. Ingold later changes what we talk about networks, um, and a network is a connected point that we transport. And so this, this is when we're focused on a place, and we're trying to get from one place to another, and it's point to point. The other way of looking at it is as a meshwork, which are entangled lines that are trails of wayfaring along which we live uh, in live in lines. And so each one of us, you can think of as a lifeline, so each one of these is one of us. We've come together today and we tie a knot together. And then we're going to go off. And sometime in the future we may tie another knot. But the way that we think about this is different. Transport is tied to locations. It's relocating a person and their effect and you're trying to get somewhere. So it's place to place. But a meshwork of antenna lines has a wayfarer. Now wayfarer is not wayfinding. A wayfaring is is when you walk along, you're actually trying to not stumble on the uh, on the cracks in the road, but you're looking around you and you stop. Uh, so we're walking over here. My wife was looking and she took photographs. Oh, those lilacs are a different color, and we stopped. We took a photograph, but we're, we're, we're trying to go point to point. Well, we had time, so we're wayfaring. We're actually looking around, and we're not just trying to get to the destination. So we pause and move on. But the trails are woven as life goes along. So here's a case where. We change our thinking from this way, where we're going from point to point and building a network, to this way, where we're thinking about lines or threads in time, or sometimes they're called strands. Um, Ingold actually talks about lines, and he's written books called um, The Life of Lines and things like that that are worth looking at. Now, when we get into embodiment, 
We have the idea of action or being, and it comes from knowing from within and corresponding along the contextures. So the first part, knowing from within, the question of system change is, if you want a system to change, how do you do that? And so the usual joke is, I know I'm supposed to lose 10 pounds, but it's not happening. I'm the only one that's going to be able to change it. So standing from the outside and telling someone, someone else that they want their system to change is like telling someone else you should lose 10 pounds. It's like you could tell them they're going to lose 10 pounds, but they may get insulted, or they may do nothing about it, but it doesn't necessarily help the system change. The people that can make the change are in the system itself. Okay? But then you have the idea of corresponding along the contextures. The contextures are those lines that we saw before that are woven together. And when we try to weave and we correspond, we actually adjust to each other. So knowing is movement, as opposed to saying that you know something that by saying it's standing still. If you think about that network of points, that the points actually are static points, and you're trying to stay on them and say, I'm going to this place. But the alternative would be that the ground of knowing is the very ground that we walk, and we move through it. So it's like swimming in water or dancing through things. You'll see that as the presentation keeps going on, you'll see more and more movies because it doesn't make sense to do clip art when you're talking about movement. And so the idea of actually putting motion into things and looking at things when you talk about systems change, you end up with the questions about, well, okay, is everything changed then? And how do we separate out what is a shift, what we call a rhythmic shift, as opposed to what is just normal rhythms? People can deal with normal rhythms. The shifts are what usually get them an issue. So we're talking about lifelines before. Uh, Tim Ingold describes the, the lifelines as corresponding with habit, agency, and attention. So habit rather than volition. So the idea that we walk, if someone's walking, you just walk and you don't even think about it. The motion is generally there. You, we can think about the volition, which is, oh, we're trying to get to that end point. But you still have to watch, and, and uh, every system has its own way and its own, its own movement. And so you want it to continue in that way. Agency rather than agency, you want action that, that, that you are actually engaged in the activity as opposed to standing outside and saying, oh, that person's agent that you, you can look at objectively. You have to be into that. So there's some sort of activity in it. And then attentionality rather, attentionality rather than intentionality. And so in this case, you have all these people jumping in a pool. If you ever get a cluster like this, the issue is, not hitting the water, it's not hitting the other people that are going in the water with you. You're trying to pay attention about what's happening around you as opposed to having the end point of being teleological and saying, I have this goal, I want to get into the water. It's like, no, I want to get in the water and not run into all the people that are getting me, that are around me. Okay. Um, we're the third section, progress um, to ideals. I'm going to change that to contextual over dyadicism. Now, this is going all the way back into um, Akoff uh, and, uh, and uh, Churchman's work, 1950, where they describe the, uh, this was methods of inquiry. And um, this is uh, Churchman now extending the work of Singer. So this is one branch of pragmatism. And what they talk about is the idea of four ideals. Uh, truth, perfect knowledge, moral good, which is perfect cooperation, freedom, which is perfect regeneration, I will pursue, and plenty, uh, perfect production and distribution. Akoff actually changes from this later on, but this is a fundamentally the root idea in 1950. Um, Akoff makes clear the idea of goals that are achievable within the period plan, objectives that are not achievable within the period plan, but achievable within a longer period, and then ideals, which are unattainable, yet worth pursuing. So in the book, um, Methods of Inquiry, this is chapter 9, I think, when they actually get the pragmatic method, what they're talking about is Western philosophy and the split between idealism and realism. And a lot of Western philosophy is based on ideal. You take these, truth. You want perfect truth, the epistemology. You have moral good, you have freedom, plenty, economics in here. But the idea is that we should be working towards ends, working towards goals, working towards an ideal of some sort is based in the Western philosophy. As a pragmatist, 
They're trying to make the reality and bridge the reality with it. So what you'll end up with is Akoff eventually making this shift where he talks about interactive planning uh, and idealized design. So there are four cases here. He talks about um, inactive, which is what we have here. We have something happen. It's like, okay, we're going to do nothing. We are inactive. We will not respond to it. Um, because there's no planning, no crisis management, so it's like, oh, okay, that's the way the world works. There is the reactive, <clears throat> which is things used to be better in the past, and so our ideal is to move back to the way things were. You have the preactive, which is in the future, and a lot of technology people are this way. It's going to be better in the future, don't worry about it, things will get better. Just hang with us, the ideal is in the future. And what ACOF actually created was interactive planning and the idealized design, which is focusing on now. And so in effect, what they've done is take the Western philosophy and he's trying to make it practical by compressing the idea of time, because he's saying, yes, there's a future and there's a past, but for any design that we do, we're going to focus on the right now. Now, this is the best that Akoff and Churchman did within the practice philosophy. I think we could do better than that by extending the philosophy. But the, this is the practical part of what Akoff was doing. And what he would try to do was say that uh, you're either being too reactive or too preactive or too inactive, you should be interactive. And so when, if you have to follow the steps that he does, in, in, in idealized design, is planning for a system right now. Not planning for a system for a year from now, but planning for a system right now that you can actually do. The system right now has three constraints on it. And, and he says, well, if we're not trying to do a uh, utopia, but there are three requirements. The first, if you're going to design a system for right now, it has to be technologically feasible. So you have to be able, if you could talk about electric car, electric vehicles, we're using a technology right now. We're not talking about technology that's like five years or ten years away. We're actually going to build something today. Operationally viable. If you built it, it would actually work. So you can't say that, you know, it's in beta and it's going to work someday. It has to work right now. The third part is it has to be capable of, of learning and adaptation, and it gains from experience and actually helps, it actually learns how to adapt to the, uh, to the new world as it changes. So interactive planning by ACOF is, is well, uh, well thought out and, and within the philosophy, but it's still based in Western dualism. And so uh, this is why I'm switching over into the idea of classical Chinese and, uh, and into the contextual dyadic. Uh, the idea of, of contextual dyadic is that it's condition dependent. So, so first, the dualism, you talk about dualism, you go with um, uh, Hegel as an example, you talk about one or the other, black or white. Uh, but with contextual uh, dyadic, first, the contextual is it's conditioned. So the black isn't always black and the white isn't always black, uh, white. It's, it depends on the time and when you're looking at it. Um, and the second thing is that it's a two complement. There's never only black or white, it's black and white simultaneously. So there's a complementary there. So if we talk about um, truth or false, what is true or false? In the Western philosophy, it's abstract and permanent, independent of context. We're looking for a universal idea. Like I, I, if we go to Newton, the, the apple always falls from the tree at the same rate. And you say, well, did you consider not doing it on Earth? You know, but no, he says, well, no, it's universal, and so we'll take it at that. But it's actually contextual. But you start from the basics and you extrapolate up to the propositions. In Chinese philosophy, the application of meanings is relative to the particular context, and you evaluate the assertion as embedded. So we don't have the idea of absolutes. And we're talking about Chinese medicine. We'll go to medicine here. The idea here would be, okay, we're going to build a, a drug and the drug will work. And the way we do it is we actually test the drug. And the question is, does it work for the population? Because um, we're looking for that absolute. We're looking for the silver bullet that actually satisfies everyone. If you look at the Chinese philosophy, they're saying, no, we don't do that with the Chinese medicine. What we do is, for example, herbs. And you go to an herbalist, and the herbalist says, I'll give you some herbs. Come back in like three or four days. Let me know how it is, and I'll, I'll, I'll adjust the herbs for you. Because what happens is that we don't know if the herbs are actually going to work. It depends on your context, your body. So the, the sort of question you ask is like, um, so I, I recently, um, uh, in the last couple of years, um, I, I decided that 
I wanted to know if I was going to get Alzheimer's. And so I went for the Alzheimer's test, and they start testing. The first thing I do is, how many, how many subjects in the, um, in the uh, Alzheimer's tests are actually Chinese heritage? They start looking, and it's like, oh, they don't have many. They want more Chinese subjects to test on. So it's like, okay, so I go on the test. It turns out I disqualify. But that's standard <coughs> medical testing, right? They go and they say, we're going to test this drug that's going to, that's going to make Alzheimer's better, and we want a universal sort of thing. The Chinese approach would be, no, 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 we don't do it that way. We're just going to see what works on you. We don't really care about everyone else. We'll try something. And when, when they actually talk about the medicine, the funny thing talking to, to the Chinese doctor about it says, why are you, why are you coming back? Like, why, can't you just give me this medicine? You know it works? He says, when you go to a doctor, do you think they actually get the medicine right the first time? So, you know, you go for whatever, uh, you know, for blood pressure or whatever, and they give you medicine, they say, oh, it's got to be side effects, but we could always try this other medicine as well. So it's not just one way of approaching it. So they're doing the same thing. They're actually doing experimentation, but they're doing it under a different philosophy, which is we're looking for the one that, the first one we're going to give you is the one that actually um, uh, satisfies both people. So universal risk of text rule. Now the pairings you have, because the idea of two comes here, is oppositions in Western philosophy. So the idea of superior, inferior, subordinate, subordinate, intrinsic value, non-intrinsic, human, non-human, those are things that come from Western philosophy because they have this idea and breakdown of two. But what happens is that in Chinese philosophy, the characteristics are in the context. A term presupposes the opposite. So Keacock actually says, cat implies not cat. So when you tell you, okay, is it a cat or is it not a cat? You're thinking, well, it could be a raccoon, or it could be something else that looks like a cat, but you're not thinking that it looks like an airplane. right? You're thinking, I say, is it a cat or not a cat? You're not thinking, it's not an airplane. Well, that's not the context we're talking about. So we're not looking at that. The context dependent. Are men or women superior? Like, in the universal idea here, they're trying to get to that. It's like a universal principle, but in the Chinese philosophy, it's like, in what context are you talking about? Men can't have babies. So it's like men are clearly inferior in that context. And you can go back and forth about what, what is superior or inferior. This leads to these frames of being hierarchical, uh, reductionist, and this entity or thing ontology. In Western philosophy, we focus on things. We want things that are stable, that are identifi uh, identifiable. Uh, Yin-yang is not hierarchical and I'll get into a more explanation of that. We're looking toward a harmonious whole. I actually prefer the idea of diachrony over harmonious whole, I think working together, but mutually engendering or constraining. So I'll explain much more of this yin-yang. But the frame is different. What we're trying to get away from is this entity thing ontology towards a process ontology, where you think about time first and the thing second. OK. Something I just discovered in the last couple of weeks, um, as I was trying to figure out how to express the idea of synchrony. So there, in fact, I came up with this article, 2024, which is fun. Um, synchronic emergence versus diachronic emergence. So what do you mean by emergence? And so this idea of synchronic emergence, at a moment in time, we have the sympathy of clocks. I don't know if you've seen this, where you, you have the metronomes, and they're on a plank, and you've got these uh, hands underneath. And what will happen over time is that you start them randomly, but they all sync up. There's a sympathy that happens there, and they're looking for that synchronization. Okay, we can compare this to uh, a floating market in the Delta in Vietnam. I've been learning a lot about uh, Vietnam recently from my daughter in laws from Vietnam. But uh, there's a lot of things that seem chaotic there, but we're not getting synchronization here. What we're getting is boats that are in a market. And so it's not like being in a place. It's actually floating. Things are changing. And you have them all moving together in time. And so you call it a market, but it's on the river. And so this idea of diachronic emergence, which is when is there a market? Not where is the market, but when is the market when all the boats come together and they're all flowing there? Now we get into a little Chinese history. Um, I decided after all the, of the work, as I, as I focused on Dao Jia. Uh, Dao Jia was named ex post 
It's it, it, like the Yin Yang school is actually between 770 and uh, 221 BC. It was named afterwards as the Yin Yang school. Uh, but Tao Jia is the philosophy of Taoism. It is not the religion of Taoism, which is Tao Jia. So it's really the religion out of this. There were six philosophical lineages, Yin Yang, Confucius, Moist, Legalist, School of Names, and Taoist. And so they're all kind of coexisting and, and happening at the same time. We can frame that with the pre-Socratics. So Heraclitus, 540, Parmenides, 515, um, 470 for uh, Socrates and Plato. So it is actually predates and then actually goes slightly after. So we have Western philosophy happening there. Uh, for those of you who like the process philosophy, uh, Heraclitus is the one that says you never walk in the same river twice. So they have that idea. Um, but we have the same thing happening in the Yin Yang school. This lines up now with the uh, development of the dynasties. You have the Western Zhou Dynasty, the, the Eastern Zhou Dynasty, and you have the Warring State period between 475 and 221. This is where most of the action actually takes place, place in Chinese philosophy, is in that period, um, before the Qin Dynasty and the Han get involved. And then we get the adoption of some of these um, philosophies. So legalism gets adopted as state philosophy in 231. Confucianism gets dead as state philosophy in 141, and then 712 AD, Taoism comes in very briefly for a period. So these are as philosophies for running government. Um, but the, the interesting part of looking at this in history, you need to remember that the standardized writing in Chinese didn't happen until around 221 BCE. So before this period, you're going, going backwards, it's like you're now on scrolls and, and things that people can't read. And they're, and they're trying to interpret what all this learning was. If that can trace it back, there's three philosophers that start like 2000 BCE, uh, Wen Wang, Zhou Gong, and they create the Zhou Yi, which is the beginning of the Yi Jing, the Yi Ching, the Book of Changes. And so this stuff goes back um, uh, in, into uh, the, the, the Zhou Yi is actually the, uh, the core of it, which is most of the um, cosmology. And the Yi Jing, the Book of Changes, actually has all of the changes going about it. And you've got the Tao Te Ching, uh, written by Lao Tzu, and that happened around this period. The Confucianism comes in around this time of the Yi Jing. And so you get the commentaries, and this is when I started understanding that uh, a lot of Chinese philosophy is around the commentaries, because when they write the uh, Chinese text, the reason that it's almost impossible to understand is it's written as yin yang. It's written as two things. And so you always have to remember when you read it, you can't read a single line. You have to read two lines. When you read two lines, it makes some sense, but then you have to, you have to reinterpret it. Okay, a little review of system thinking. Uh, Russ Acoff says, authentic system thinking, and this is the West, synthesis precedes analysis, and the containing whole is appreciated. So we take the thing to be explained, look at the containing whole system, the behavior of the property, the containing whole, and the behavior property, the thing, and the role. So this is typically the way that we think about uh, system thinking, or I've, I used to teach this, and I, I always say, I spent my first half of the class teaching you Russ Acoff because he is very, very clear, and then I spent the second half of the class telling you why he's wrong. Um, he's clear, which is good, because it gives you a stake in the ground, but you may or may not agree with this. But this is the, the idea that uh, most of the system thinking that we have, which is about synthesis, putting things together, not analysis taking things apart. To be more complete about the way we talk about systems thinking, we have the ideas of, um, of function, structure. Um, so, we have, so, so my definition of system thinking is, system thinking is a perspective on parts, holes, and their relations. Okay, Parts, holes, and their relations. And that means we're talking about part, part. We're talking about part, whole. And we're talking about whole, whole. And the whole, whole is the part that people usually forget about when we talk about system thinking. Holes alongside holes in time. But if we go back to this, um, there are the basic definitions of, of, of systems. Uh, function, function is the contribution of a part to the whole. If it's non-living, we call it a function. If it's a living, we tend to call it a role. We have structure, which is the arrangement in space. Okay, you got that? 
Okay, so we have process, which is an arrangement in time, and we have behavior, which is a system change to initiate other events. And so you have interactions between systems that cause behavior. Behavior doesn't really happen when we talk about one system by itself. We tend to have it the other way. Now, usually when I'm teaching this class, I say, okay, so what comes first, process or structure? Now, this is one of those questions that seems kind of obvious. So I was walking across, you know, I was actually at this ISSS Sonoma meeting, walking across the campus with G.A. Swanson, and I said, which comes first, structure or process? And he says, it's obvious, isn't it? I go, oh, I don't get it. The answer is process comes first. Process comes before structure. When you look at a mountain, we think that a mountain is structure, but that's only because of our perspective. A mountain changes as well. So a mountain and structure is the slowest changing process. Okay, if we take that really to heart and we say that process precedes structure, what happens if we actually now reorder, rethink systems thinking, and resequence it so we think about process and behavior before we think about structure? Which brings us to the exercise. Okay, can we deprecate systems thinking in the pursuit of ends, these ideals, objective goals we have? We have a dartboard here. You have a goal, you're trying to shoot to that goal. You shoot, you shoot darts into the board at various places. And elevate the idea of rhythms. And the rhythms are contextual and dyadic. So for the contextual and dyadic, I've got a uh, volleyball game here. Volleyball is nice as a metaphor for this because uh, we're going to play volleyball in a pair. And there's this rhythm that's going on, which is, I, I suppose it's possible that if the ball comes over the net, one person could hit it back. But generally, the rhythm is that you have a person that uh, receives it, then they set, and then they spike. That's what you would like to do. And it goes back and forth. And so as opposed to thinking about just the goal, could we actually think about going this way? So, we're going to, um, we are here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to take a break, um, five, ten minutes, and then come back and discuss for ten minutes this idea of thinking about systems thinking more like rhythms and context, putting processes first, 